Look at this child, for example. What did this child do? He is barely 15 or 16 years old at most. What does he know about politics? And the expectation was that the entire world would see these photos and be outraged. To be honest with you, uh, it's, it's been depressing to see this sort of disappointing um, lack of action by the international community. Um, my work before the revolution began um, comprised of taking photographs of any accidents or incidents that happen under the auspices of the Ministry of Defense, including drownings or suicides or a fire. After the revolution began, our work became uh, only photographing uh, men, women, and children that were tortured to death in the dungeons uh, of the Assad regime and the intelligence branches of the Assad regime in and around Damascus. Um, for me, from day one, um, uh, whenever I was asked to go and take photographs of some of the, uh, the, the victims um, that were tortured to death, it was a truckload of bodies that had come in from Dara, where the revolution had begun. And from that, that, that first day, I, I, when I went, we, we looked and we saw um, not just that these bodies were tortured to death, but the way that the intelligence officers were treating the dead bodies with, with complete disrespect and, 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 you know, weren't even treating them as if they were bodies of, of, of human beings. Um, it was from that second that I knew that, that this nation cannot continue with these intelligence branches operating, that from that moment um, nobody could work with anything that is part of this, this horrendous regime. And it was from then um, that, that my decision was to, to no longer be any part of it, um, but to do anything that I can do to help. Why would the regime want the photo these photographs? Surely that provides a record of what had happened to these people. Um, you know, this was, it was, there was a routine, you know, pre-revolution that any incidents or accidents that happened under the auspices of the Ministry of Defense um, would, you know, uh, would result in, in the documentation of, of any of these incidents of death and so on. And so it was sort of a routine that just continued, um, but with the advent of the revolution, um, there were s massive amounts of civilians and protesters that were being arrested. Um, and what we did was really continue the regular work, but because all these people were being killed, uh, we were now being asked to go take pictures of them because they were killed under the mm -hmm. auspices of the government and the Ministry of Defense. But surely the regime must have known that these, this at one point could be used as evidence against it, as, as proof of the, the kinds of uh, terrible things that they had done to people. The officers and the regime, soldiers, etc., that were uh, needed to prove to their higher commands that they were actually fulfilling the orders um, of killing and torturing civilians in these horrific ways. And, and that was another reason that they needed to do that, to, to show their superiors that they were doing what they were told to do. You know, uh, another thing that's important to remember is that they don't see a consequence for actions that they do. So even in documenting these things, they believe that they are above international law. I also see that there's numbers here. Can you explain what those numbers are? So there are three numbers that go along with each uh, one of uh, these victims uh, and these victims' bodies. Um, the top number uh, that appears is the number of the individual when they were detained. And so once you enter prison, you no longer have a name. Um, you go by this number that you are assigned. The number in the middle um, is the number of the intelligence branch. So it shows who was responsible for this death. Absolutely, it does. It shows the specific branch responsible for, for the death. Uh, and the third number um, is a number that is assigned uh, by the doctor. Um, and it's what I call the death number. Uh, in this number, it shows the sequence of death and the number uh, in terms of individuals that have been processed before him. Um, and, and so that's that final number at the bottom. 
At the beginning of the revolution, um, the numbers that we would be called to go and photograph were small, um, 10 to 15 um, uh, bodies per day. As, as the revolution went on, um, these numbers uh, began to, to climb up to the 50s and, and even more uh, in a single day uh, that we were taking uh, photos of um, regularly. Um, this first one of these pictures that I'm showing you, this picture here, for example, shows the scale. This is a single day. Uh, in terms of killing, it, 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 any human being looking at an image like this um, sh should be beyond outraged. It, it shows the inhumanity that exists. You could see in the top of the photograph um, these bodies that are bagged up uh, and, and then shipped out to places. Right that and this picture also shows the phase before these bodies are shipped off either to a mass burial or cremation or, or, or whatever they, they take them. And if you look at the photo, this shows this isn't a mortuary. This isn't a, a regular room. And the fact is that um, is, as the bodies would pile up every single day by these huge numbers, there was no room inside the hospital that could fit them. So this is actually an outside uh, hospital 601 in a garage um, where these bodies were, were at this point being processed, bagged up, and, and shipped out. You can see some of the bodies are very emaciated. You're right, there are many emaciated bodies, and sometimes people look at some of these photos and believe that this person has been being starved or tortured for, for three or four years, but some of them have only been tortured and, and, and starved for, for a matter of months, and you still see that effect. And even if they um, give any answers or make any confessions, they are still tortured to death. It, it's not a matter of just gaining information. You also saw young people. Yeah, absolutely. I saw children. And look at this child, for example. What did this child do? He is barely 15 or 16 years old at most. What does he know about politics? If anything, he may have joined a single protest where they were calling for for equal rights, for liberties that everybody enjoys, for, for, for asking for dignity, uh, if he even did anything. Um, but this, this child, um, among others, were taken and starved to death or, or, or tortured to death uh, for no reason at all. It is hard enough to look at these photographs as photographs. What was it like for you to be on the other side of the camera seeing this every day? I was uh, really very scared all the time that, that I could be the person being photographed, that my family could uh, end up uh, in that position. And so um, I had to work in a very sort of secretive way uh, and to be uh, very smart about how I would help sort of get these photos uh, and, and compile them somewhere else. So it, it involved a uh, huge risk uh, and through a lot of fear, um, but, but it, was, it was working as, um, as carefully as I could. The, the photographs, as we, as we documented in our regular job, um, they went through these different processes. We had to take the photos and we had to attach them to a specific report. We had to archive them. We had to put them in a database. And, and this entire process took time. And so what I would do is I would take advantage of, of this process to be able to get these photos on my own personal flash drives that I was able to uh, sort of get and then sneak out with me every day as I went home. And at any point, if I was ever caught with a single memory card or a flash drive that I was taking on a daily basis um, from, from the photos of these victims, um, it would have been the last day of my life. In, in all the days that you were there and you were seeing this, there were people around you who were responsible for this. Did you ever ask, did anybody ever explain why this was happening? You know, you're asking a question assuming that there is some humanity in some of the people that were doing this work, but they lack any humanity whatsoever. And, and even to be able to ask or, or, or question or, or just even get any sort of understanding of why is this necessary, why is this happening, that is good enough to be ultimately guilty. Uh, and um, you would end up being the person you're taking a photo of, tortured to death. Um, there were intelligence officers everywhere watching every move we did, even if our eyes sort of um, 
if, I, if my eye sort of looked away or looked at somewhere where I'm not supposed to be focused, um, that was enough to get, to get anyone in trouble. And so there was no room for any sort of questioning. We did our job and, 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 and went home, and, and anything outside of that uh, could have led me to be the one being photographed. So, so eventually you make the decision that you can't take this risk anymore. You get out of Syria, you have all of these photographs, you're going to show the world. What did you expect the reaction to be when you shared these photographs with the world? In the process of, of, of getting these pictures to, to the world, um, I risked my life, and I've risked the life of my family members, my relatives, um, re relatives that helped me uh, escape, um, uh, all these people, you know, all this risk taking, and, and there was a lot of danger that, that happened. Um, and the expectation was that the entire world would see these photos and be outraged and stand in solidarity with the people of Syria uh, and, and do something uh, to, to help alleviate uh, what's unfolding. Um, but to be honest with you, uh, it's, it's been depressing to see this sort of disappointing um, lack of action by the international community uh, as they view these, these, this evidence of war crimes. Does it make you think that this was pointless, that you shouldn't have taken the risk? Um, no, quite the opposite. I believe that I did exactly um, what I had to do. I believe that I did the right thing and I would do it over again. And I won't stop um, until justice is served and um, the right of those oppressed will, will not go to waste and justice will come one day um, for all these victims and their families. Uh, and the right of these victims will, will never go away. Uh, the right of justice for these victims will never go away as long as there, are, there is someone and there are people that are fighting for it and so I'll continue to fight. After, after every incident like this in human history, people ask the question, what is it that turns ordinary people into people capable of such evil? And what is it that gives ordinary people the courage to do the right thing? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, after everything he's seen and everything he's done, mm -hmm. what he thinks the answer is to that question. Um, I don't really know the answer, but I can tell you that what these people in these photographs, what, what they have done, um, their bravery, um, in coming out into these first protests um, against a horrendous regime who we all knew were capable of doing terrible things. Their bravery does not even come, uh, m m what I did, any courage that I may have, doesn't even uh, come close to the bravery and the courage of these young men and women that went out in peaceful, nonviolent protests asking for their rights. Uh, and, and to me, what, what they've done and the courage that they had and the bravery that they've had, I, it's, it's unimaginable and, and it's well beyond anything that I've done.